All right, so the channel's been a little bit dead for the past few months. I've been very busy, so I haven't had any time to really do anything interesting. However, uh, I was over on the R Nixies part of Reddit, and a user there posted the question that had anyone ever built a Nixie clock only using transistors or vacuum tubes. Now, while I would have loved to have done one using vacuum tubes, and I've seen people that have done them, it is possible, I do have experience building one just using transistors, so I decided I'd bring this guy out, and I uh, told the, the guy on Reddit that I'd make this video as a reference for him, and I've been meaning to do one anyway. So, I've already done several Nixie clocks using conventional TTL chips, and I have done some using uh, microcontrollers, although I find those to be a bit less fun when it comes to construction, because you're just typing in some code, and the actual hardware part is very minimal. So I, I like giving myself a challenge. Anyway, this this uh, <laughs> this probably took over a year because it sat in various stages of uh, uh, incompleteness in my garage before I took it with me to college. But anyway, let me get the display up here. Now we need to zero that out. There we go. Yeah, this might be a bit tricky with the glare for my the, the lighting in here is terrible. But, uh, yeah, so it's a full six-digit display. This is actually a vintage Burroughs display unit. Uh, it originally only had five tubes in it, but I uh, cut some of the plastic slots in the back and made room for a sixth. You can see the tens of hours is just a little further left than the rest of them. And I also made sure to use uh, two tubes that had decimal points to give me a uh, hours and minutes separation. Came out pretty nicely. The uh, cabinet, in fact, uh, is apparently like a 70s computer uh, cabinet. It was empty when I got it. It was unfinished. You got those lights on the side, and there's a standard uh, grounded plug on the back, like kind you'd see on computer cases these days, with a fuse connection, which is nice, and a whole bunch of older uh, SCSI-style slots there for hooking up modems and stuff. Kind of neat. But... I bought this because it was the right size for the boards that I had to go into it, and then I added all the switches, and I used the uh, lamp holders over there for some LEDs to give a readout. The uh, The bottom row does absolutely nothing. I didn't have that many functions. But uh, this top row absolutely does. Uh, for reference, we actually have... Let's see... I want to say... What did I do? Power, display, time base, and then AM and PM. Something along those lines. Um, but more importantly, I suppose we should take a look inside. The front's not all that interesting. And this is actually a very accurate clock. I've had it running for months on end, and it does not gain or lose time. But it is based directly off the mains, 60 uh, hertz coming out of the wall socket. And in a lot of places, that might not be quite a good way to measure it, but a, uh, a crystal-based time source in this one turned out to be a huge pain to accomplish because of the transistors I was using not to not wanting to operate those kinds of frequencies. So, I already had this loosened. And any good project requires a good amount of LEDs. So, I made sure to put one on almost every important stage because during the testing phase of this thing, it was a necessity to know exactly what was and was not working. <laughs> now, for now, we're going to ignore this board up here that's got the chase light sequence going because that was actually a later addition. The uh, important thing is the upper board here, and there is also a matching board identical to it underneath that. And they have edge connectors at the bottom to route power and some of the other functions. And then the uh, long copper uh, strips at the end here for a much larger edge card. I have actually used those to transfer all of the information from the counter stage up here down to the decoder stage. And then the power supply assembly is over on the left. Um, as far as the power supply goes, I've got a transformer here with multiple taps, uh, I think 16, 25, and 9. I used the 9-volt tap, rectified that to get uh, the 5-volt. I've got a 5-volt uh, regulated power supply for all of the main logic. I have uh, a 12-volt supply that I had originally set up for a synchronous motor to use as the original time base. That didn't go the way I wanted it to, but I left it in there anyway because I'd already wired it. And then I have a boosted high-voltage power supply for the display, which is actually based off a secondary primary winding 
that the transformer has. This transformer could be set up for either uh, 120 or 240 volt use. So it's got two 120 volt windings on the primary side. And if you uh, tie them in series, you get 240, but for normal operation, you're supposed to tie them in parallel. But I just undid that connection, and uh, if you apply 120 to one set of windings, you get 120 at the other set. Not as much current, obviously, but uh, it works extremely well for providing a uh, high voltage source, because then I can just route that through a very simple voltage doubler, so, uh, a few diodes and a capacitor. I've got the schematics, so I'll, I'll show that in a second. So, I'm going to flip this around without touching anything important because, yes, there are dangerous voltages in here. Okay, that's probably a better view. So, just to sum up what the hell is going on in here, the row that you see right here, starting from this point and working that way, is our seconds. So you can see our this uh, each pair of transistors, the little silver guys, are our flip-flops. So each one is a, a T, a toggleable flip-flop, and it is uh, cascaded to the next one. So you can see that one glowing and transferring the pulse onto the next. And then we have, there are four flip-flop stages for every module 10 counters, go from 0 to 9, and three flip-flop stages for every 0 to 5 or module 6 counter. And then that recycles from here back down to this next row, and this next row is our minutes. And then the one sitting over here by itself is the hours. Uh, these LEDs don't glow quite as brightly. I made the mistake of buying different LEDs. These ones up here are super brights. I didn't know that at the time. And these guys down here are a bit on the dim side because we're only showing a one. Now I can, I can alter the... Uh, I have time set mechanics that allow it to, to, to be set while the clock is running. So we toggle the hours here. And then I also have a reset function built in. So the entire thing can be reset and, and time set at will. Uh, there also is a clock stop. As you can see our one board up here just to stop doing anything. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to halt that just because it gives the, uh, the camera way too much business to look at. What you can't see underneath this green board, though, is actually the time set uh, controls. So there are a pair of... Uh, transistorized exclusive OR gates, and those are being driven by a debounced push-button setup, so a capacitor that uh, charges up the resistor, and then you ground it, it dumps it, and that triggers the gate. Uh, very, very simple. Uh, works really well. And then the other thing is the reset system for the flip-flops. This was a sticking point when I was uh, putting this thing together. I could not get them to properly reset the way I want to. So let me just uh, clear out the minutes. The seconds I don't have a clear function for. I didn't really find it necessary. But um, after all of the module 10, you want it to count it to 9 and reset to 0. Otherwise, it's just a standard binary counter. So my solution to that, after a lot of trial and error, was just to use a relay. So each stage ha can be pulled uh, basically, one of, one of the legs of the, the flip-flops is, is pulled down so that it goes back to zero. And so we have this bank of read relays right here. Each one has a pair of transistors set up to like an AND gate, so that when the conditions are met for each, sta each, um, each counter stage's reset, it will uh, it'll trigger the AND gate, which will in turn trigger the read relay, which will ground uh, the respective legs of each of these uh, flip-flops and set them all back to zero simultaneously. Now I went with a relay because it was a direct connection and I tried using transistors, I tried using MOSFETs, I tried using opto-isolators and none of that worked. I always wound up with race conditions. One of these stupid things would always remain active. Um, and the real trick with this was even the relays didn't want to work properly at first. There was uh, They weren't being held on long enough. As soon as the conditions were met the next pulse would always uh, result in the very first counter stage being left on. So to uh, fix that, I actually added a one microfarad uh, capacitor to each stage along uh, over the uh, relay coil so that when it does actually energize, even after all the other ones that are holding the end gate on have turned off, you still get it holding on just long enough so that if a pulse comes in during that time, the first stage remains grounded and shut off. So just a bit of an insurance policy. And that works great. Uh, you can, in fact, when it's running, you can hear it 
you can occasionally hear the relays click in the background. They're very light. And unfortunately, I can't really show you the decoder board. So each of these counter stages obviously uh, produces a binary output, specifically a binary, a binary coded decimal output. And that is routed, the connections come out to the undersides of these, so all of these come out that way, and all of these come out this way, and that goes down to the lower board. If we aim this just up there, you can just barely see there are rows of more transistors hidden in there, and each one has its own dedicated uh, decoder system. The decoder is really simple. I actually uh, I found the idea for the decoders in a book. Uh, just, just to clarify, I didn't really come up with any of the, the, uh, the flip-flop designs or anything that are in the circuit. All of this is common knowledge. It's on the internet. Not hard to find. I just amalgamated all those ideas that I found into the final product. And it just happened to work better than I expected. So as, uh, as easy as it is to, to look at this, it's a lot easier to figure out what's going on with the schematic. So I'm going to flip over to SCH here. And this is the schematic for the module 10 counters. So at the top here, we've got our Nixie tube symbol. This section here is our decoder, binary to decimal. And then we have the counter stage with each of the four flip-flops here our little reset relay circuit, and then on the far right we have our time control circuit. So if we go ahead and zoom in and take a look at one of the flip-flops, I, I pulled this design directly off the internet. So if you look for a, a simple flip-flop, this is one of the, the kinds that you'll find, and I sort of chose component values that were common, so 10 kilo ohms and 4.7 are the only values that are in the flip-flop circuit. Uh, I did not attempt to do any calculations for biasing or anything fancy like that. I just slapped it together in a breadboard, determined that it worked, and tried it several times to make sure it wouldn't fail, and when I was happy with that, and I just made a whole bunch of them. Uh, if you're in design work, this is not the way to do electronics. I don't recommend that. I would actually try bothering to put more effort into it, but uh, I didn't know much at the time, so there you go. But the idea is you get an input pulse here. I found this extra capacitor at the beginning to be necessary because um, sometimes the, well, this stage would feed back into the previous one and trigger it again and had some other goofy results. So this, this little buffer capacitor here just prevents it from, from triggering the previous stages and acting funny. And uh, when, when it's powered on, one of these transistors here, the 2N quadruple 2 is a super common part, one of these is going to be favored. So one of them is going to turn on and the other one's going to not. It all comes down to how they were manufactured. There's no way to tell from the outside. Just one of them will turn on at random. But once one is powered, the other is prevented from being, uh, from being triggered. So you can see we have... Oh, why am I even explaining this? It's too early in the morning. <laughs> We have 5 volts coming down into the collector leg of our 2N quadruple 2. If this one is drawing, if this one, if current is flowing through the emitter of this one, the uh, base current that would be going into the other transistor is basically being drained away. You know, it's you're not going to get enough of this 10K to trigger this, this half of the flip-flop. However, if we apply a pulse, and this is where things get a little bit fuzzy, from what I can tell, one of these diodes is uh, effectively, somehow it's going to trigger the opposite flip-flop. Once that one kicks in, this one becomes favored, the base supply to the other side gets cut off, and it changes states. And to indicate that, I've got this LED coupled off of here, and that actually grounds through this one side of the flip-flop. And you can see I've got this label, we have our A output and our A bar output and those then pass up into the decoder scheme either way. But I have each of these chained and then we look here, I have a diode in each stage uh, coupled to the left side, the A side. This is actually our reset. So if we ground that, it will drag the collector leg of this one here to ground and ensure that the uh, flip-flop actually goes into the A bar state where the LED is uh, not lit or is, is lit. I forget. Yeah, uh, I would just look at the schematic and, and, and just copy that if you really wanted to. But the, the decoder here is actually the, uh, 
more nifty part. This I got out of a, a fairly old book that dealt with all sorts of very early circuits and it's it's actually rather ingenious. So each pair of transistors up here, these are, I use MPSA 42 high voltage transistors otherwise you're gonna, if you try using like a 200 quadruple 2 or a, I don't know, 3904, you're gonna blow it out. The the voltage across them from here is, is it's not what they're rated for. So MPSA 42 or similar high voltage MPN transistor so each one of these, you can see the, the uh, bases are biased with these 4.7 kilo ohm resistors up to 5 volts. So they're normally held on, effectively. And each pair, out of each pair, only one of them at a time can be active based on these two. So these two here are triggered from our very first flip-flop. And the, the first flip-flop is effectively selecting whether or not we get an even number or an odd number. So one of these connects to all the even numbers and one of these transistors will connect to all the odd numbers. And if we get this one powered, then our only options are the number one, the number three, the number five, the number seven, and the number nine. And if the other one's powered, we get all the rest, zero, two, four, six, and eight. And then the rest of it, which is narrowing down to just one of those options, comes down to these diodes here. These are individually coupled to the other stages um, uh, come on, logic class, we have B and B bar, C and uh, C bar, all of our normal and uh, anti-outputs. And uh, I just pulled this directly from the book. When the right combination are in place, if any one of these diodes is pulled to ground through a stage, it will shut off both of these transistors. The base current will be flowing through the diode instead. These won't trigger. And eventually, one of these stages will have, uh, none of them will be grounded. And that'll allow the one transistor who has a clear path through its uh, collector to emitter to trigger and turn on the respective digit in the mixy tube. That's the best way I can explain this at this time of the day. And then, of course, we have the reset circuit built off an AND gate. So we're using uh, the D connection here and we're using the B connection here, so for 9 we need, so this is a 1, 2, 4, 8 in binary, so we have the 8 position, and we have the 2 position, 2 and 8 is 10, we don't have a physical 10, so that triggers the relay here which grounds out the whole thing and resets it back to 0. And then the time control, the time set control was interesting. I pulled this off the internet. I played with the uh, the values a little bit to make sure it would reliably trigger. But effectively the last stage comes off, goes into the exclusive or the actual time set guy here, which is uh, again a, a capacitor charging through a resistor, which keeps this, uh, trans this transistor on. Press the switch to set the time and it grounds it out and we go from having, let's see, this is normally a logic one, and it uh, actually no, it's normally a logic zero. It dumps it and uh, creates a logic zero, or vice versa. I swear I'm going to have to dub this over. Maybe not. Either way, the exclusive OR will only produce an output when it sees two different inputs. So that's you, you're, it's guaranteeable you're going to have different inputs. If this is a one and this is a zero, it'll trigger. If this is a one and this is a one, you press the button to make it a zero, it's going to trigger and vice versa. Very, very useful if you want to have a time set while the clock is running, especially if you're working with TTL. This is, I, you can use like a 7486 to do this. It works really well, although I do recommend having a Schmidt trigger for a debounced input or something similar. And then of course we just pull off to the next stage. So that's your module 10. All right, so this is the module six. This is for, you know, like the tens of minutes, the tens of seconds, uh, except for the tens of hours. So we only have three flip-flops because that's all that's necessary to produce the output. We're only going from zero to five, so we don't need the D or the eight uh, flip-flop, not necessary. And as a result, our decoder is also greatly simplified down to six transistors and even uh, six diodes on here because we don't have the additional ones for the D connections. So very, very simple, same exact wiring layout, flip-flop, uh, or the reset circuit here is set up specifically so that we trigger off of the B and the C here. So we get four and two is six, trigger that, reset it. Time set control, exactly identical. 
Yeah, you can just stack these things together. So you get to, you put two of them together to get effectively a divided by 60 counter. However, the time controls are only at the end of the minutes and the end of the seconds stage. Well, this should be fairly obvious. Now, the Module 10 and the Module 6, these are perfectly fine for the, the seconds and the minutes. However, the hours was a different story. Um, under normal circumstances, when I do the TTL, the, the reset circuitry for going from 12 o'clock to 1 o'clock, if you're using uh, non-military time, can be a bit of a pain because you have to get a trigger on a 13. And if you're using Module 10 and Module 6 counters, well, you don't go past 9. So how do you deal with that? And so my solution was to not bother getting super fancy. Instead, I set up the last stage as a standard binary counter. So four stages, just like a module 10. But I modified the original decoder design. This is the only part that I really designed myself, I would say. I modified it. So we have an additional two stages. We actually have from 1 to 12. Uh, simply eliminate, simply shift everything over so we go from, instead of going from 0 to 11, we go from 1 to 12. Just rewire it the way it goes to the tube. So you can see we have our hours tube here. We have our tens of, hour, uh, tens of hours and hours. And in addition to the additional stuff here, I also have at the upper right here these diodes. Now what these do is when we get a specific number triggered, so like we have zero here, when this one is powered on, this also triggers this transistor here and that triggers this relay. Again, this is more complicated than it needed to be, but this is just how it worked out to be. And it, Essentially, any time we have a 1, so in the case of our clock that's going to be 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, and 12 o'clock, any time we have one of those conditions, this final transistor here, so we have 10, 11, and 12, each of these three stages is coupled to a pair of diodes. One of those will trigger the uh, 0, one of these will trigger the 1, and one of these will trigger the 2 in the hours digit, but they will also power on this relay which will switch the tens of hour digit from going from 0 to 1. So we'll get 11, sorry, we'll go 10, 11, and 12. And then it'll reset back to 1. The hours relay turns off and goes back from 1 to 0. Uh, originally, I would just tried tying uh, that straight to each of these diodes, and it worked for the first two stages. The last one just wouldn't do it. I could not figure out why the hell it wouldn't. It was just being obstinate, so I said to hell with that. Put in a transistor and a relay, bam, worked fine. But this this right here is really what made it a snap. Instead of having to do two separate counters and a whole bunch of associated logic, I was able to just build one large standard counter from four flip-flops and then just extend the standard decoder design. And I used to have a piece of paper where I actually worked out the logic for all of this, and looking at it now, I have no idea what the hell I was doing. Uh, must have been a brief moment of genius or something. And then of course we have our relays, uh, reset circuit here, just like all the rest of the designs set up so that when we hit the magical number of, well actually I can't remember if I have it set up for 12 or 13. It should be for 13. Let's see, we've got it coming off of the C connection here and we've got it coming off of the D connection. So we've got it coming off of eight and four which is well, 12. So, yeah. Wait, really? Is that how I set it up? 1, 2, 4, 8? I guess I did set it up for 12. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, your mileage may vary. I'm just saying this is how I did it. I know this is how it works. And it does work. And I do technically have some schematics of the power supply, but I never got around to finishing them. I kind of finished the clock before I finished the schematic. I already had it worked out on paper. But this is the boost circuit I used. So we have our, our one primary uh, winding here for 120 volts switch connection with a fuse. Then we have the secondary primary disconnected by itself, which goes through a voltage doubler with some eight microfarad capacitors. These have to be rated at at least 450. I would recommend 500 just to be safe because our unloaded output voltage was 312 volts. There are 
Aquai then of course figured out uh, the current value for each of the tubes, like no, no, two and a half milliamps I think is standard, and then found the appropriate anode resistor to go with that. And then of course, like I said, there are no, uh, no chips or ICs or anything in here. So when it came to voltage regulators, I did the same. This is a simple series pass regulator circuit. You have a, a Zener diode here, a resistor to get the correct operating current through that, and then uh, 2N3055. These are actually mounted on the back of the case for proper heat dissipation, and this biases that to about 5 volts after the drop through the uh, from the collector through the base or base emitter voltage, sorry. So that actually worked out well. These other windings that wound up being for different things. I had one of them powering the synchronous motor which had its own regulatable and adjustable regulatable supply. That kind of got ditched. It's in there but I don't use it. There was one of these supplies was being used for the display which is actually something I don't have a schematic from, but uh, as you can see, as you saw from the intro, the, this display is a, sequ a sequential activation. So each each anode of each Nixie is actually operated through relay contacts, and a capacitor on each relay or near each relay charges up, uh, triggers a triggers a transistor which turns that relay on. That relay then powers the next stage which turns on in sequence and then on and on, on. And when you shut it off, it disengages in the opposite direction which is just a neat little feature I want to add. And then one of these 16s I actually wound up using for the time base. Uh, like I said, originally I had a synchronous motor system planned that failed, but I didn't have a use for this extra winding and I just sort of capped it off. And that is why I have an additional board slapped on top of... Let me back out here. It's actually why I have an additional board slapped on top of the design here. So this is actually the time base. So we have these wire connections coming in here. This is actually off of our transformer. And it's difficult to see from this angle. Let me try rotating this thing around. It's a little bit better there. So we have our AC input right here. Uh, I have a power supply connection for the board here and then we have flip-flop stages identical to these here, 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 and here but then this nonsense down here is actually something a little bit different. My original design for this was just to have a, uh, a divide by 60 so that's that's what I did. So I had a, uh, a pulse shaper so the incoming AC, uh, AC signal passes through a 5.6 volt Zener diode to clip the waveform, make it a nice square wave. But to reduce the possibility of spikes, and that's the biggest thing, one of my previous clocks, I used a, um, a, a simpler system, but it runs too fast because if any spikes show up on the AC line as a noise, it'll accidentally trigger the next stage. With this, however, I borrowed an idea out of... Uh, Texas Instruments book, they actually have a, a schematic for a TTL Nixie clock. Their solution to line noise was to use a monostable multivibrator uh, set up as a one-shot. So this little section here, the capacitor and some transistors and the sort of nonsense, that is actually there to provide a, a one-shot. So after the signal passes through the 5.6 Zener and gets clipped, it passes into the mono, and the mono it has a, an RC network that is set up so that you would get about 90% of the uh, of the duration of the input signal. So when that cycle comes in as a positive wave and triggers it, it will wait for about 90% mm, of that um, the period of 60 hertz. I think it's about 15 milliseconds or something along those lines. I, I calculated it out on paper. That part uh, it, it waits. For that period of time and during that time if any additional signals come in the one shot will not trigger again so you'll get one pulse it'll wait for 90 percent of the signal so about 15 milliseconds which once it's reset there should be no other inputs however if for some reason we get line noise a spike or something during the time that the one shot is triggered those extra inputs will not cause it to send another output it'll just sit there waiting so once it finishes its 15 millisecond period it resets, we can wait for another peak to come in and trigger it, 
and then that will send a signal to the very first flip-flop stage. Now when I originally had this set up, I just had it set up to divide by 60 effectively. So you have a divide by 10 and a divide by 6 counter. In fact, I don't think... Uh, no, actually I did have room. They go from this way over to here. This board was a little small, so I had to kind of cram things in. So if I start this up, we'll see. So this is our very first stage coming directly off. So this is running at you know, about 60 hertz. Or, um, sorry, probably about 30. That triggers over. As you can see, this little guy right here is running at about 2 hertz. And then that passes into our first flip-flop stage back here, which is running at 1 hertz. Or, yeah, losing myself again. Now, the problem with my original design with this was I originally had a read relay set up uh, for each of these. So one would be reset at 6, one would reset at 10. But because of the speed of the incoming signal, I ignored uh, race conditions, which are a, a very important thing to learn in digital logic. And that is, if the signal coming in is too fast, just like I had a problem with earlier, one of these stages may not reset, or the condition to reset the circuit may occur before it's supposed to. That is to say, one of these flip-flops triggers the next one, but, but the two that would normally trigger the reset were, were were in an active stage, like in between active and not being active, and it would trigger it falsely, and I would get a um, an output that wasn't one hertz. And well, I was a little stumped on how to fix the problem. What I wound up doing was going to the guy that had actually done a transistor clock before me. There are transistor clock kits available that you can get that hang on your wall. And I studied his schematic and discovered that he basically had the same problem. And he discussed how he eliminated the race conditions by setting up additional transistor logic down here at the bottom. Which I unfortunately do not have a schematic for. I recommend looking at the, uh, the one that's on the internet. And that, that is eventually the, this is actually what resets these. Instead of using relays, these, these, the circuit up, uh, up there will actually prevent these from triggering at the wrong point and yeah that's really all I can say about that either way so this this actually is a nice accurate output like I said I've run this thing for months and months on end and it doesn't seem to gain or lose time it's always right on the tick I don't keep it synchronized with my with down to the seconds but it just works it works really nicely and oh yes, you can see the 2 and 3055s I have set up for the voltage regulators. The regulators take up absolutely no space, which is nice. So I'm hoping that at least gives uh, a gentleman on Reddit that wanted to know a little more about this a general idea. Sorry I couldn't get more specific. It's, I don't know, I, I haven't actually thought about how I built this in, in um, over a year. I sort of just assembled it and then I let it run. But then if we shut the display off here. Now the, uh, the reason why this doesn't actually disengage as fast as it turns on comes down to me forgetting about how capacitors charge. Capacitors do not charge and discharge at the same rate, two different equations. And I'm using the same resistor that charges it to also discharge it. If I'd set it up so that when the, when the relay switches on each stage, and then switches off, it uh, discharges the cap through a, a lower value resistor, I could have set it up so that it has the same disengage rate as the turn-on rate. I actually played with the values until I was happy with the speed at which it turns on. And then we also have a stop function. Both of our resets, these switches are actually really nice. They have a momentary down position and a momentary up position for time set. So. Again, you don't have to stop the clock on this design to actually trigger the stages. You can leave it running and then just go for it. It doesn't affect the previous stage. But then I also stop that. This switch right here actually switches which input we're using. So down is our 60 uh, hertz off the wall socket. But then if we flip it to the up position and we flip this switch, this actually triggers the old uh, synchronous motor, and it is extremely noisy and obnoxious. 
and there's a good reason why I didn't use it, is that even with me attempting to adjust it and getting it right, it still wasn't exactly at 60 hertz. So I don't bother using that anymore. It's just kind of in there. But I don't have the heart to take it out because I kind of hardwired it into the design. A little unfortunate. Oh, but I suppose I should just give one last shot of the power supply section. I did not actually bother showing that off. The power supply does not take up any room at all. So, transformer and that little board right there has an upper and a lower. The lower section is the boost circuit. The upper section is uh, the adjustable regulator for the motor, which has its own 2N3055, so our reference and our adjustment are on there. We have a fairly decent sized capacitor on there for uh, removing the ripple for the 5 volt section and for the 12 volt section. And then everything, because I, I figured, you know, something might screw up and I might need to disconnect it, I opted to use these nice little connectors and uh, 90 degree pins for all of the main sections. In fact, this top board here with the counters is completely separable from the lower one because I used, uh, I used inline style connectors, headers. But we have all shrink wrapped connections. I tried to make this a nice as nice and clean as I could get it. I was working with a very cramped space because this this box right here takes up so much room this way that I was surprised I was able to get these boards in without the connectors touching the back panel and grounding out. But Oops. Yeah, no. This is probably one of the more rewarding clock builds that I've done. The TTL ones are rewarding in a sense, but this is the time that I really tried to tried to make something kind of unique. And I hope I didn't bore you to death with the description and my constant mumbling, so thank you for watching, and I hope this gives you a, a little idea that it's not impossible to do these sorts of things. It's just time-consuming.